Well, I want to thank everyone out there in, uh, on their phones, on their computers, for checking out my YouTube channel. Uh, about four years ago, I put my first YouTube channel out into the internet, and the response was, was really strong, and so that made me want to want to share more of my information with the public. And over the last four years, we've had about 1.3 million views. That's been a lot of fun, and it's really been encouraging for us because it shows there's a lot of, a lot of need out there for uh, the information that we're sharing. So I just wanted to thank you for taking time out of your busy life to check out our channel. What I have in my hand is the next step in our evolution as a system of trying to communicate ideas to you. There's a book that we've written. It's called Your Genius Body. And really what it is, it's a summary of all the work that we've put into our practice, put into functional medicine over the last about nine years. So if you like the ideas you see on today's video or some of the other videos on our channel, I would highly encourage you to get your hands on this book. This book is really a summary um, and a great reference for all the ideas that we use to help our patients as we share in these videos. So you can get this if you go to www.beyondmthfr.com and you'll have an option there to purchase the book either in paperback which uh, is always a little easier on the eyes or you can also download the digital version for your Kindles and iPads. So I hope you enjoy this coming video here and then please stay tuned for the end. We'll have a special message for you at the end of the video as well. Good afternoon everyone, this is Dr. Rostenberg again from Beyond MTHFR and I'm sharing with you today a video, a shorter video on some of the concepts we use in our office regarding dopamine. I made one about a month ago uh, talking about ADHD and the purpose of that video was to simply show that raising dopamine is effective for about 90% of children with ADHD and, and what they say is simply that giving kids Ritalin, which I, which I don't agree with, but the fact that Ritalin works in 90% of the cases simply highlights the fact that raising dopamine improves brain function in people with ADD and ADHD. And we have a similar kind of um, concept with uh, addictions and drugs and their relationship to dopamine and so this is this can be a sensitive subject. Uh, we certainly know um, drug abuse and drug addiction is no joke. It can destroy people's lives and their families. But there is a relationship to dopamine and drug abuse and, and addictions that I want to highlight. So in our practice, one of the things we use is this bell curve. And this is probably my favorite slide of all time that I've made. Because what it does is it captures in an easy to see graphical form how dopamine levels are going to influence how we feel. And basically, for today's video, you can, you know, you see this bell curve. We're going to be talking about individuals who tend to have what we call a low catecholamine phenotype, where they just have low levels of dopamine, of norepinephrine, of epinephrine in their body due to genetics or the and and environmental factors. Especially people with MTHFR type issues, they're just slower at making BH4, which I'll tell you about in a minute, and therefore they tend to have lower dopamine and catecholamine. So the purpose of this chart is just to show you that when people are stressed out, they tend to go in one direction or the other. And so for today's video, just like the one we made about a month ago on ADD, we're going to be talking about addictions and substance abuse and how that relates to low dopamine. Any investigation into drug use or dopamine um, you know, the relationship between drug use and dopamine, you're going to find a lot of data to support that. Um, I've been looking in the research for a few years, and there's quite a few studies that highlight how, how directly correlated the high we get from drugs uh, is to the release of dopamine. So in other words, we're, we're all seeking dopamine, whether you are dealing with drug addiction, whether you're addic dealing with food addiction, whether you're addicted to a video game, whether you're addicted to watching sports, whether you're addicted to anything. The goal of that addiction in our physiology is a, is a hit, a main line of dopamine and adrenaline into our body to, to perk us up. It's just our behavior. We're wired that way. Uh, there's only 400,000 neurons in your brain that have dopamine, that are dopamine-containing neurons, and there's like 16 billion total neurons. So it's just a m tiny, minuscule fraction of cells in our body that actually, in our brain, that make dopamine. So it's very important. But basically, this study doesn't matter if we're talking about methamphetamines, cocaine, morphine, heroin, nicotine, 
they all have a release of dopamine effect on our body, okay? And these are the SNPs. People with comp issues and MTHFR, they're really a big focus of ours, but that's a, these addictions affect these, these individuals with these genes more, more significantly. I like this uh, piece of research came out last year, and it basically, you know, addictions, you think of things that are harmful, dangerous drugs, you know, crack cocaine, methamphetamine, heroin, etc. And everybody knows the risks associated with that, but there's literally, and, and um, you know, there's literally not much difference between somebody who's getting a hit um, off of, a, off of a, a pipe for some drug in there or somebody who's checking their social media every 30 seconds or every three minutes all day long. Now the side effect of those choices might be different. We can, we, can, we can have that discussion of what would be the side effect of being addicted to a drug, how would that affect your health, and what's the addictive side effect of being addicted to Facebook and Twitter. But the point is that you're releasing the same chemical in your brain. And researchers are starting to be concerned about this from the point of view of, you know, we think it's harmless. We look at this cartoon, everybody's staring down at their phone. It's, it's an addiction. We've become addicted to this piece of technology that we drag around with us that you know, somehow we managed to live without for a few thousand years. But that's what you're getting. You're getting a dopamine hit when you get when you try to get your likes and your posts um, give those attention. So it's not just drugs. It's sometimes innocuous things, just like using your phone um, can fit into that addiction concept. So we we know that dopamine. We know that adrenaline is released when we when we use drugs. Okay, so this is just research from a few years ago. It just says the same thing. And they're saying this is, their hypothesis is that elevated noradrenergic signaling, okay, so I'll say it differently, high catecholamines, a release of adrenaline, a dopamine burst, right? You get all these catecholamine molecules into your system, you're going to get high. Due to environmental or genetics, right, we've talked about that, um, is a big factor in abuse, okay? We're looking for the high, we're looking for dopamine. And so people who abuse alcohol, nicotine, marijuana, heroin, cocaine, caffeine, etc. What they're trying to do is like I showed you just a minute ago, they're down here on this curve. So when they get stressed out, when the mortgage payments come due and the you know, parents are fighting, they're getting a divorce and they're breaking up with their girlfriend or boyfriend, you know, life is happening. We get stressed out and because of their NTHFR genetics and the status of their gut and other factors, they end up having low catecholamines. So they, they, they go towards an addiction of a substance to try to self-medicate. What they're trying to do is move this, move their star, you know, they're down here in the low area, they're trying to bump their dopamine levels back up into this optimum range where they feel good. I mean, that's just what they're doing. They're not evil people, they're just trying to self-medicate. That's what, med that's what drugs do. And the research is simply confirming that. That's all this research says, okay? When we talk about addictions, we kind of could use the word craving, right? An alcoholic has an alcoholic craving. A cocaine addict has a cocaine craving. Sugar addicts have sugar cravings, right? Similar, similar situations. The effect on the brain is the same. It's just the side effects are different. And this is research that basically says when you have a low availability of dopamine, you're going to have a higher craving. That makes sense. Dopamine gets you high. When your dopamine receptors stop working or your body starts to get used to the high, it's not as effective anymore, well, what do you do? You go for a bigger drug or a bigger high or something more uh, aggressive to raise dopamine, but of course the side effects get worse as you do that. And I'm just sharing this research with you just so that it, you know, it's not my opinion, it's, it's what the research says. And if we can look at the research from the point of view of low or high dopamine, we can really begin to help people. And that's what we, that's what we love to do. Here's a study on, on cocaine, and you know, dopamine increases are caused by cocaine, okay? That's how it works. Chronic cocaine use, though, using it chronically, reduces the, uh, the dopamine signaling, so then you're forced to do more drugs. Your body gets used to the same stimulus, so you do cocaine once, you do it again, you do it over and over and over again, eventually your high goes down each time, because the body is sort of used to that amount of dopamine. It gets becomes less effective. This is what drives drug addicts to, you know, become more self-destructive. If we can understand 
However, in this, you know, you may not have someone who's addicted to a drug, but you may just have somebody who's addicted to um, anything that I mentioned, right? Like video games or gambling or, you know, getting in arguments or whatever they're addicted to. Addicted to tr working out. They work out two times a day, six days a week because they're addicted to the high. If we look at it through from the lens of they just need more dopamine, we can intervene with healthy nutrients and some dietary changes and some supplements using their genetics and honoring that and we can begin to help them make more dopamine naturally. I really enjoy uh, seeing people with neurotransmitter issues get better because it's, it's life-changing, right? To go from having a mood disorder or um, a problem with fatigue, a problem even with your thyroid because dopamine, um, the core basic building block of dopamine is tyrosine and tyrosine is also the building block of your T3 and T4 so there's this connection with energy, um, focus, all kinds of things, your drive. I mean, we, you can change people's lives when you get their neurotransmitters balanced. So just more data. I like to use data to make my point and you know, I learned from reading the research and then it kind of highlights what science is thinking. But again, um, addiction is related in this study from 2017. They're saying that in addiction, it's consistent that the dopamine response is getting weaker. So people become addicted as they're chasing that high. And as you do a drug or do something over and over again, the amount of dopamine you get each time you do the drug goes down, so then you're forced to go up to higher levels, and that's the nature of addiction. And I think the same thing is true with video games. You know, someone who's addicted to video games, playing games till four in the morning and can't get their life together, they didn't start that the first time they got their Xbox and took it out of the package. They played for half an hour, and then 45 minutes, and then an hour, and then so on and so forth, and eventually took over their life. Right? And that's the nature of addiction. So it is related to dopamine though. That's the point of this, of this short discussion. And again, just another piece of data from a few years back saying that the craving elicited from cocaine, uh, by, okay, by cocaine uh, users, their, their craving for the drug is simply related to changes in catecholamines. All right? So there's something to this. And, and again, you don't have to be in a rehabilitation facility to use this information. You, it's important to look at your life, the things that you're addicted to, the things that you crave, the things that your your family craves, your children, your coworkers, your loved ones, right? Friends and family. And, and you can start to see people's dopamine levels based on the choices and the habits in their life. And it's really rewarding to help people balance that. I mentioned just briefly too that MTHFR is related to low dopamine and it's certainly been true in our practice. You know, we've worked with a few thousand people using these ideas and basically individuals who tend to show signs of low neurotransmitters, a la the craving, the ADD, the ADHD, the excess of sleepiness, the grumpiness, um, the substance abuse, the addictive behaviors, they're looking, they're telling you what their problem is in a language that we don't normally use, but the body's communicating very clearly that they don't have enough dopamine and neurotransmitters in their brain. Now there's other neurotransmitters besides dopamine, but again, I'm biased. I think dopamine is the kind of penultimate fountainhead of our brain function. It's the neurotransmitter that controls and influences so much of our behavior. There's other important ones, but this is, we really focus on treating dopamine. So MTHFR issues, either you know a deficiency of the vitamin or having genetics that slows the system down, you end up with low amounts of BH4. And this is a study, again, uh, from 2008 that basically highlights it very clearly that BH4 is the rate-limiting enzyme for the synthesis of neurotransmitters. In other words, if, you don't, if your MTHFR system isn't working well or you don't have enough B vitamins, you can't raise dopamine. If you can't raise dopamine, you'll, you'll have a higher risk of addis addictive behaviors. And we can help people fix that, okay? That can be improved with the right functional medicine and epigenetic approach. Showing you the chart one more time. Um, again, we're talking about the low catecholamine person with addictions and substance abuse right here. And the goal with all of this uh, is just to educate you that there's certain symptoms that go along with low dopamine. And once you start to learn to read people that way, you'll, people will start to tell you how their neurotransmitters are doing based on, again, choices they're making and their mood, things like that. Here's a basic protocol. I, I Again, I not not really treating over YouTube here, but just giving you some ideas. This is These are kind of common, commonly used tools in our practice to help people raise dopamine levels. And 
I believe if this was used maybe more broadly in the um, psychiatric and psychological uh, world, you may see better results uh, with patients going through counseling. They just may need more support for dopamine for their addiction, and that might help them a great deal. We don't, we won't know until we try. But these are the basic tools: L-tyrosine, methylfolate, uh, B12. There's three different kinds that would be, you know, that you can use based on your education and what you're trying to work on. I usually typically default to methylcobalamin, uh, but there are times we use Ideno and hydroxy. Tryptophan might also be needed for people, in the, especially in the latter part of the day, to help them with some um, serotonin production. But really, we're focusing on dopamine in the beginning. And you know, you got to treat people as people. They're not just uh, one lab test or one factor. They're multifactorial, and looking at them holistically and getting an understanding of what they've been through and what's going on with their digestive system and their their gut and their brain and their neurotransmitters and their genetics. Putting that all together is a lot of fun. So I hope you enjoy this video. Thank you, thank you so much for listening. And again, Dr. Rostenberg with Beyond MHHFR. We got the book on our website now, so check that out if you want. If you haven't seen it yet, I think it's a, it's a good reference for all this uh, information we're sharing with you on YouTube. And uh, good luck. Thanks so much for watching. Uh, you've made it. You've made it through the video. Hopefully, there's some some information here that you can relate to your own life, to your friends, family. Um, I'm just basically sharing with you everything we use in our practice. I don't believe that healthcare should be something that you always have to pay a ton of money to get the information you need. I'd like to get all the information we can out there for free. And that's part of what this YouTube project is all about. So if you like this video, if you like our channel and the information we have, get yourself a copy of this book. But even more than that, if you're somebody out there who's looking for help for yourself, for a loved one, for a friend or family member, you reach out to us. We have a clinic that serves people from over 20 different countries. And we have people, people traveling from Europe, traveling from all over the United States to see us in person. And we also do work over the internet uh, through a telemedicine practice. So uh, Red Mountain Natural Medicine is the name of our office here in Boise. And if you like what's on this video and you need some help yourself, uh, please reach out. We'd love to hear from you and we'll figure out a way to help you get the help you need. Thanks so much and have, a, have an excellent day.